Well, hello everyone. I'm Apostle Charles Perry, and I want to welcome you to our YouTube channel here at Word of Restoration International Church. You know, this channel is our hub for new, fresh, and creative content from every area of the ministry here. We'll have something for everyone in your family, from children to teens, men's ministry, women's ministry, marriages, and so much more. You know, plus the Word of God will always be the glue that keeps us all connected so you can get the Word of God every time you come here to our YouTube channel. Now listen, I want you to make sure you spread the news and share this with your friends and family and coworkers and make sure you subscribe so you can be the first one to always receive from this amazing tool that we have here. Now listen, I wanna thank you uh, for coming to our YouTube channel. And I guarantee you, you're going to be blessed. There's something available here that will bless your life. Now listen, I have to go because I want you to start moving through our channel. But remember, we are restoring lives with the Word of God. And when your life is restored, you know what I've been saying? Been saying it for 20 years. You shall have double. God bless you. And we love you with the love of God. Next on Restoring Lives Broadcast. People have accepted Jesus as their Savior, but not as their Lord. See, when you accept Him as your Savior, He saves you. But when you accept Him as your Lord, when you make Him your Lord, now He governs you. He, he's, he's Lord. See, if you're going to be in the kingdom, you got to realize God is a king. And, and, and your opinions don't matter to God. Because he's a king. He doesn't need your vote. And so Jesus is, Jesus is Lord, and we must yield to the will of God.
chapter number two Acts chapter number two Acts chapter number two tonight is lesson number four uh, of this series entitled repentance a kingdom requirement repentance a kingdom requirement and so this requirement uh, is what positions us for kingdom empowerment kingdom authority and kingdom living uh, because it places our lives under the lordship, the leadership, as well as the rulership of Jesus as king. Verse 37 says, now when he had heard this, now when they had heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent, say repent, repent. say it one more time. Repent. Now we define this word repent and realize that it's ultimately, it ultimately leads to a place of change. And so uh, that brings us to the objective for this series and that is to be brought to a place of personal change and transformation or transformation in personal change. And so this type of change that we're talking about is not change that is fruitless. Uh, but change that produces fruit that is meat or suitable for repentance as we saw in Matthew chapter 3 and verse number 8. So we looked at what I call the five phase process of change, the five phase process of change. Number one was a hatred for sin. Number two, godless sorrow for sin. Number three, the confession of of sin number four is turning from sin and then number five is the desire for righteousness and holiness and so we said that uh, this process is what causes us to be consistent in change it causes us to endure and stay aligned with the reversal of our decision when it comes to repentance so tonight I want to give you what I call the seven applications of repentance. That's what we'll talk about tonight, the seven applications of repentance. And, and hopefully we can get through all seven of them. Number one, number one, 
Repentance is a part of the foundation of true Christian faith. It is a part, it's, it's not the sum total of the foundation, but it is a part of the foundation of true Christian faith and leads us away from acts, works, and deeds that lead to death. Repentance is a part of the foundation of true Christian faith. Our faith in God, true Christian faith. When we talk about our faith, I'm not talking about, you know, um, faith for, for something that you believe in God for. That's not what I'm talking about when I talk about Christian faith here, but I'm talking about uh, the faith as the apostles taught. I'm talking about our belief in Jesus Christ. Our belief in Jesus Christ must have a foundation. And so a part of that foundation, so anything, any foundation uh, that is built, it is built to sustain what is built up on that foundation. Uh, that if you're going to build a home, some kind of structure, there must be a foundation. And there is something that goes into that foundation that makes that foundation secure and makes that foundation strong. Well, the foundation of our Christian faith, the foundation of what we truly and genuinely believe, if we're going to be able to stand on what we believe, then what we believe must have foundation. And so repentance is a part, go to Hebrews chapter number six, repentance, repentance is a part of the foundation of true Christian faith and it leads us away from acts, works, and deeds that lead to death. Now in Hebrews chapter number six, and we'll look at verse number one, and we'll read all the way down to verse number three, but in verse number one, it says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Now, this word perfection, uh, another word for it is maturity. Let us go on unto maturity. And so a lot of believers, uh, and it's the desire of God and the will of God for us to mature, for us to grow up, uh, to go on to maturity. Uh, but there's some things we have to make sure that is a part of our foundation. There's some things that are part of our Christian belief that we must make sure that we are settled in those things. Because if we're not settled in those things, we'll be going on with the structure of our lives and have not established a strong foundation. Can you say amen to that? And so he says here, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the what? Come on. Foundation. The foundation. So what we're about to read is a part of our foundation. He says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Repentance from dead work and faith toward God. So he says now we should be able to go on unto perfection and not have to go back and lay again, not have to go back and secure uh, the foundation. That foundation should be in place. Foundation should be strong. Foundation should be uh, uh, solid and we're able to build on that foundation. And so a lot of believers, again, we're trying to go on to the next level, trying to go on to the next phase, and we've not gotten settled in our foundation yet. And so it's like building a house. You build a house, and when you build a house, there is a foundation that must be laid. And when that foundation is laid, uh, there is going to be an inspection. They come, they come out, they do an inspection of that foundation because you plan on building your house on that foundation. So they have to make sure that that foundation is secure. It's going to be able to hold what you're going to put on it. And so they will give you, if it passes inspection, then they will give you the permit to go on and build. Right? Well, the same thing with Christian faith. 
And the same thing with God. Now, if you, if you read on to verse number two, look what it says in verse number two. Uh, verse number two says, and of, of the doctrines of baptism, all of these are foundational things, doctrine of baptism, and of land, of land on of hand. This is foundational, resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Now, watch this, verse number three. What does it say? Verse number three says, and this we will do. Do what? We will go on unto perfection if what? If God permit, because God's doing the inspecting. He's doing the inspecting, and if your foundation does not pass inspection, then God will not permit you to go on and build a Christian life. And so a lot of believers now, so if I go on, despite not having uh, passed the inspection, if I go on and build on that foundation, it won't be long. The structure that I build on it, it's going to give away. It's going to fall. I'm going to have holes. I'm going to have cracks in my foundation. It may shift. It may move. And how many believers, they're shifting in their Christian life. They're moving in their Christian life. They're leaning in their Christian life because they still arguing over foundational stuff. We're still arguing about laying on of hands. We're still arguing about baptism, eternal judgment, resurrection from the dead, repentance from dead works, faith towards God. Now, I love what the, uh, what the CEV says. I'll just read verse number one in the CEV. And I think the latter part of that will really just, just bless you. Look what he says. He said, we, we shouldn't need to keep talking about why we ought to turn from deeds that bring death. Well, you would think that wouldn't even be a conversation, that somebody would have to talk to you about turning away from something that's killing you. And he says, so, so why, why are we having to keep talk about, talking about? See, that should be something that's foundational, turning away from this, turning away from that. Uh, this is not God's plan for your life. And so here Christians are trying to live a Christian life, and we're still arguing and debating over things that's killing you that you keep trying to do, and we're trying to convince you that you shouldn't be doing that. The wedges of sin is what? Death. So, so there are some things if I don't turn away from, those things are going to kill me. And so he says here, we shouldn't need to keep talking about why we ought to turn from deeds that bring death and why we ought to have faith in God. Well, why I got to believe God? Why should I have faith in God? Well, all of that's foundational. That's, that should have been stuff you had in your foundation when someone first introduced you to Jesus Christ, when they was talking to you about turning away from a certain way of living because it was bringing death in your life and that you need to put your faith in God. And he says, so now that we, we've been in this thing three years, five years, 15 years, 20 years, and we still arguing about whether or not you ought to trust God. You mean I got to put my faith in God? You mean I have to believe God? Well, I see why you can't build. You never got a permit. Amen. And so, again, so repentance from dead works. So when it talks about repentance from dead works, it's talking about uh, these deeds that lead to death. These deeds that lead to death, uh, these things that, that's taken life away from us. Amen. So that's the first application. So repentance from dead works is a part of my foundation of true Christian faith. Number two, repentance begins with a change of mind and results are ends in a change of conduct. It starts begins with a change of mind. In any area of my life where I want change or where I expect change, that change must begin in my mind. I have to change the way I think. To change and not change my mind, not change the way I think, is just a matter of time. That change is going to be short-lived. Why? Because my mind is going to bring me back to its old way of thinking. So I have to change my mind. So, so repentance begins with a change of mind and it ends in a change of conduct. That if there's really been a change in my mind, then my conduct will eventually change. If there's legitimate change in my mind. Go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. So to repent... It's to change or have a change of mind. Has, 
has my mind changed? Has my mind changed? Am I still thinking the same? I'm saying I change, but I'm still thinking the same. Change of mind involves both a turning from sin and turning to God. This change of mind is a change of attitude and mental perspective, which results in a change in behavior and conduct. In other words, it means turning away from a way of life that is contrary to God and turning to a way of life that is defined by God. I want to say that again. Turning away, turning from a way of life, L-I-F-E, a way of life that is contrary to God and turning to a way of life, L-I-F-E, but cap, capital L-I-F-E, a way of life that's contrary to God and a way of life that is defined by God. So let's look at Romans chapter number eight and verse number, verse number two. Now, when we talk about repentance, we can sum it up like this, surrendering one's life to God's will as expressed and revealed in his word. Surrendering one life. I, I surrender. God's not going to take my life and put it under his will. I must yield my life. I must surrender. I must give up. There's a way that seemed right to man, but the end thereof is destruction. And you don't know the destruction till you get to the end. Amen. But I must yield my life. Yield my life. I must surrender my life. I must subject my life. I must put my life under the will of God. And, and that's what it means to surrender. God's not going to force me. God's not going to make me. God's not going to coerce me. God's not going to deceive me. God's not going to manipulate me. God only gets glory when I yield my life, when I choose to submit my life, regardless to the right of way of the flesh, regardless to the right of way of my own thinking, the, regardless to the right of way of my past, regardless to the right of way of what I think, I must yield my life to the will of God. Have you ever pulled up to um, an intersection and on your side, on your side, it said, Yield. Biggest day. Got it? <clears throat> and the other person who, who's coming, well, I do one better than that. Let's do this. You pull up to a stop, a stop sign, four-way stop sign. Now, you get there first. All right? And because you are there first, what do you have? You have the right of way. Watch this. Now, someone pulls up here. Now, you here first. They pull up. Who has right of way now? I have right of way. So, I pull out because I have what? Right of way. But they choose not to stop. So, what am I going to do? I'm going to argue my point and prove my point that I have right of way. Or for the safety of myself, at least, I choose to yield and let them go on even though I have the right of way. So when we talk about yielding to God, when we talk about yielding to the will of God, you have your own way of doing things, and, and, and you made your mind up a long time ago, this is what you're going to do. You made your decision ahead of time. This, before you made Jesus Lord of your life, you had all these things about what you was going to do, how you was going to do it, how you was going to live your life, how you was going to conduct your affairs, how you was going to handle your wife, how you was going to respond to your husband. You had all of that, but then God comes up later. 
He comes up later in your life and you have right away. But when you see God coming, when you see the will of God coming, you got to make a decision. If you're going to live and have life, you got to make a decision. I'm going to yield to the will of God. Now, that's what we must do. But, but now, if I'm going to yield to the will of God, i got to change my mind. Oh, I'm going to argue with God. Well, God, this is what I want to do. Well, God, I was here first. Well, God, this is how we do it. We Johnsons. We do it like this in the Johnson household. You know, you can argue with God or you can make a decision for the sake of your own life that you're going to yield to the will of God. Can I tell you something? And, and this, this, just, this just us talking. It's just us talking. You are never going to win against God. That's right. Amen. Now, I know you bad. I know it's your thing. And you can do what you want to do. And even though I'm the pastor, I can't tell you who to sock it to. Because <laughs> it's your thing. You can do what you want to do. But I'm telling you now, you're never going to win against God. When God pulls up in the intersection of your life and you're about to make a decision, even though you, you made this decision before God said anything to you. And now God comes up, Johnny come lately and change your plans. The best thing you and I can do is yield to the will of God. Amen. Tell the person next to say yield. Telling you, it costs less to yield. <laughs> costs less to yield. <laughs> Amen. Be riding around with fender benders and, and car halfway tow up. <laughs> it costs less to yield. Repentance is surrendering, giving up. I give up, God. You, you are Lord of my life, and, and, and the unfortunate thing and reality is <laughs> many people, <laughs> many people have accepted Jesus as their Savior, but not as their Lord. Amen. See, when you accept him as your Savior, he saves you. But when you accept him as your Lord, when you make him your Lord, now he governs you. He, he, he's Lord. See, if you're going to be in the kingdom, you got to realize God is a king. And, and, and your opinions don't matter to God because he's a king. He doesn't need your vote. And so Jesus is, Jesus is Lord and we must yield to the will of God. Oh, you had Romans 1, I mean Romans 8 and verse number 2. Watch this now. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the law of the what? Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of what? Sin, Sin and death. So there, there are two laws operating in the earth. One is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That law operates in the believer and the law of sin and death. Now, that's the law that you and I operated by before we made Jesus our Lord. Before we came to Jesus Christ, we were governed by that law, that principle of sin and death. Sin and death ran our lives before we came to Jesus. Okay? Sin and death ran your life because you didn't live your life for God. You live your life for yourself. You live your life according to your plan, according to your purpose. You live your life based on your desires, based on your feeling. That's how you govern your life. Your life was governed. My life was governed pri uh, prior to Jesus. Our lives were governed by this law of sin and death. Now, watch this. Now, but when we receive Jesus... When we receive Jesus, now let's look at it like this. Let's look at, now let me, let me say this. If you were to jump off of this building, now there is a law in operation. 
And that law is called what? Gravity. Now, so it doesn't matter how much you pray, how much you love God, how much you go to church. You can tithe, you can offer, you can give your whole check each, each pay period. You can, give, you can give your whole check to the things of God each pay period, right? You can fast, you can pray, you don't never have to eat. You can just fast and pray and do all that. You can be rich, you can be poor, you can be black, you can be white, uh, you can be educated, uh, uh, whatever. You jump off the side of this building, I promise you, you will not go up. <laughs> you will go down. And why will you go down? Not because you don't love God. You will go down because you will step into a law. And that law is called gravity. Got it? Now that's the law. Gravity is a law. It's the same law that's holding us to the ground right now. If it were not for the law of gravity, we'd, be in, we'd all be in here levitate, uh, uh, levitating. We'd be, just be floating if it wasn't for the law of gravity. Gravity is not the weight of the individual that holds the individual to the ground. It's this law called gravity. Gravity holds us to the ground. Okay? Now watch this now, because we're talking about two laws here. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has freed us from. Has freed us from. Has made us free from. The law of sin and death. See, we were operating in that law. But when we got saved, we stepped into another law. And that law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus freed us from the law of sin and death. Now watch this. So, an aircraft on the runway, on the tarmac. Now what holds that aircraft to the ground is not the weight of the aircraft. What holds the aircraft to the ground is gravity. But now, when the pilot, when he goes down the runway and he satisfies another law called aerodynamics, now, when he satisfies that law, Thank you for watching today's broadcast. If you have been blessed by the teaching of Pastor Perry, come visit us at Word of Restoration International Church. For additional information, please call us at 281-431-5930 or visit our website at www.woric.org. Here at Word of Restoration, we are restoring lives with the Word of God. And when your life is restored, you shall have double.